Welcome to the Rex Andrews Show. Glad to have you with us. Uh, excited to have all of our new subscribers and listeners um, coming on. If you are new to the show, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe so that way you can get all the latest updates. Then we ask you to stop by the show website, rexandrewshow.com. The reason we ask you to do that is um, when we have our guests on, these are amazing people doing amazing things. And we generally don't have enough time to cover everything that they're doing. And so go to the website, you can look up their profiles, you'll get information on them, links to their social media and their businesses, et cetera, their books, whatever. So um, stop by the show website. And then the last ask I have uh, for our new listeners is, if you like what we're doing, I'm not bashful, I'm not afraid to beg. And in fact, I got a collar on today. So I'm gonna say, I'm a well-dressed beggar. And if you like what we're doing, give us those five stars. So that way we move up in the podcast distribution systems. We'd like to welcome back our existing, existing list, listeners. It's always great to have them with us. Um, we're always happy to have new people and returning guests. There's so many choices for podcasts out there today. So thanks for tuning in. And we have an, a little feature that we do um, that... Uh, we always identify listeners in different marketplaces that are in. So I was looking at the stats today and I'd like to welcome those who are listening in Palm Bay, Florida. So uh, welcome to the show, Palm Bay, Florida. You know, we've been really blessed real quick. Uh, the show is listened to in 32 countries, over 500 cities across six continents. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. We have a worldwide family. So welcome back. All right. We've got a great guest today. Um, you know, when I go out there and look around to book people, and it's, it's fun because you find different people with different specialties and doing different things. And that's what I try to do is bring some unique things to the show and tell their stories. And that's what it's all about. So uh, our guest today, you know, I'm excited to uh, introduce him. Uh, first and foremost, he's a husband and a father, you know, two greatest roles any man can ever play. And uh, I always appreciate that as a father of five. Um, he's an author, and then this is interesting. He's got uh, some particular stuff that he's doing down at the University of Texas. He's a law professor, but he specializes in a particular niche, and we're going to talk about today. So welcome to the show, uh, Steve Collis. Steve, how are you this morning? Doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Now, you're dialing in today from uh, Austin, Texas, aren't you? That's right. Yep. Well, welcome to the f fans in Austin. I love Austin, Texas, and I've interviewed probably five or six people out of Austin. There's a lot of interesting things going around in the Austin uh, circles today. All right, so let's get to it. Let's tell your story. Um, you know, the show's about biographies, and so we want to go back in time, and we want to learn about you and how you got to what you're doing today. Um, so we're going to ask you things like, where were you born? Where were you raised? And those can be completely different. Uh, I had a guest come on the show, Ellie Soja. I reference her almost every time. She moved 63 times before the age of 15. So amazing influences on her life. We want to know about your family life. So siblings, um, parents. Now, what I found interesting, and regardless of our age, uh, parental influence is huge. And I kind of throw people in three buckets after hundreds of interviews. Um, the first one is the totally supportive launch parents. So they were fully engaged and pushing you along and providing you know, that support and just with you every step of the way. Then there's sort of this middle bucket where I call it sort of the non-participatory uh, parents. They love their kids. They were trying to support them, but they were so busy eking out an existence and a living that they just weren't have enough time to be engaged. And uh, that motivates kids in a certain way. And then the last bucket, I don't like very much, but it is a one that's out there. I call it the struggle bucket. OK, the struggle bucket is uh, kids that might have been in an environment where there was addiction, abuse, um, extreme poverty, uh, dysfunction, things like that. And it motivates the kids to be, hey, I don't want to be anything like mom and dad. OK, so once we get done with that, we want to also know what you did as a kid, you know, what type of things you did, sports, um, music, drama, computers, etc., reading or even shoplifting. We had a guest on the show, uh, Larry Cole who by the age of 15 was a car thief. And so, you know, people do different things with their time. Uh, and then we want to pop around your education, you know, see what uh, things were invested in, who you are today. Look at some pivot points, you know, along the way said, hey, I wanted to do this or that. 
and then we get into the things that you're doing today. And I, in our pre-interview, you're doing some really interesting things in a particular niche with law and education. So, and also religion. So if you could, Stephen, I don't worry about that list. I'll fire them all out to you. Where were you born? I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Oh, wow. That's the first person I've interviewed this born in Albuquerque. Uh, lo- wonderful city. Um, now, where did you grow up there? So now born in Albuquerque, and then I was uh, born and raised in Socorro, New Mexico, which is a small town about an hour south of Albuquerque. Okay. All right. So what did your parents do for a living as you were growing up? So both of them worked at a small college in Socorro, New Mexico. Uh, my dad was kind of a research engineer studying explosive materials, and my, uh, my mom worked as a, an administrator there at the college. Oh, wow. So education was a big uh, environment in your home? Um, I would say yes, in my home. It, it was certainly a, at least, it was a big deal, at least in part of my hometown. I would say okay. part of my hometown couldn't have cared less about education. It was kind of the, cla- <laughs> it was the classic like <coughs> counties versus college student environment that you often okay. see in movies, right? right? And yeah. We were kind of a mix. Our, my family was, was kind of a mix of a long time multi-generational family in this town. Uh, but also with some connection to the college. But my dad was not a professor the way other some other people were. And so that was a little bit different as well. So he was into research then primarily? Well, he did. Yeah, he worked for a, an entity that did kind of government contracts, exploring different types of explosives and, and weaponry, but also how things would withstand explosive attacks, right? So if okay. we had... U.S. is developing a tank or something, and it gets hit by a Scud missile, you know, doing the research into studying that out. And it worked well because Socorro, New Mexico has a lot of empty land all around it where yeah. they, the school bought this, basically a whole mountainside. <laughs> was able to test this. Test, do a lot of testing. Fantastic. Uh, do you have siblings? I have one brother and one stepsister. Okay. What's the age range between um, your family siblings there? Yeah, so my brother is uh, about two and a half years older than I am. Okay. Yeah, and my stepsister is about two years younger. Well, that's a good mix. Uh, how was your relationship with them as a kid and growing up? It was kind of typical sibling behavior. So really, my stepsister, I never really lived with. My parents divorced when I was 10, and I never lived with her. But we've you know grown close over the years uh, after my mom remarried when I was older. Uh, my brother and I grew up together, and it was, it was typical – sibling behavior he beat me up most of the time and <laughs> now as adults we're friends yeah i had two brothers and it was wrestlemania i can remember that some days my mom would just throw us out of the house because she was so tired of us and the wrestling and you know that kind of stuff so certainly understand that okay now you got your your parents got divorced at age 10 was that impactful uh, on you i mean was there a big emotional train wreck i mean hard hard to not based you know if you have a divorce at age 10 um, yeah, I w- you know, I wouldn't call it an emotional train wreck, but I would say it certainly affected me. It affected my outlook. I remember at the time just being absolutely devastated. And yeah. then, you know, kids are resilient and you move on. One thing mm-hmm. that my parents did very well is despite their going through a divorce and then trying to rebuild their own, you know, relationship lives, uh, they never mm-hmm. stopped parenting. Oh, so great. They always, had, they always had, I felt like, you know, good expectations for me and my brother. They always, uh, you know, tried to stay on top of us with uh, discipline and checking our behavior and whatnot. And so I give them a lot of credit for continuing to pay attention to us despite going through what they were going through. Sure. And then uh, what did you do um, in your spare time? What were your interests? What did you do uh, outside of um, school? Going, uh, starting, I would say, in maybe sixth or seventh grade, it was all basketball all the time. So you can't see you can't see it on the screen, but I'm quite tall. I'm six six. Okay. And in Socorro, New Mexico, that made me a veritable giant. Yes. And so what I did was I I I played basketball. Um as I got into high school, things changed a little bit. I started to feel like there had to be more to life than just basketball. Sure. And I started my family really had no religion or anything, but I started studying religion, uh, lots of different religions. Okay. Uh to see I just felt like there had to be more to life than than what I was experiencing. And so nobody knew it about me, but I would spend my time at night, late in the evenings in my room by myself with books from various religious traditions, studying and trying to figure out kind of what this universe was all about. Wow, that's cool. Was there a pivot point that said, oh, gosh, 
Steve, you know, as you're in your head, that you wanted to do that? Why did you start do, um, studying that? I can't think of a precise pivot point that led me in that direction so much as just, you know, like many teenagers, I felt lonely in my high school. Sure. Um, my high school, it had a pretty big party environment and I was not a partier. Mm-hmm. And so that, that led to a lot of evenings where I didn't feel like going to the parties. And so I was, I was home and I was sitting, I was sitting around and I just started thinking there has to be more, something more, there has to be more to life. And that's when <clears> I just started studying. And so it was, you know, studying Islam and Buddhism and Christianity and Catholicism. Uh, my town is heavily Catholic. So I spent a lot of time studying that and just really yeah. asking deep questions about what makes sense to me. Great. So let me ask you, how big was your high school? What was how, what was the size of your graduating high school class? Uh, somewhere between 100 and 120. Okay. And so there, there was about 400 people in the high school total. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I grew up in Golden out here in Colorado. And my graduating class was 423. So, uh, you know, a little difference. And it, I always ask that question um, because um, it, it's kind of makes an impact. You know, if you're one of 16, that's a different dynamic than one of 300. So looking back at your time uh, growing up, was there someone set aside your parents and family uh, as far as a media family? So mom and dad and step, you know, dad, things like that. Was there someone who made a big impact in your life that you said, wow, you really latched on to and you felt like they were um, a big impact, you know, growing up? Sure. And we're still talking about my, my formative years. And yeah, my right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably the most impactful outside of my immediate family uh, would be the family who, who are now my in-laws. Okay. Because uh, as I was on this path studying about different religious backgrounds and whatnot, I noticed this one family that stood out to me and uh, they clearly had some devotion to religion that I had never experienced before. I, I would describe my family as not atheists, although I think there are some atheists in the group, but uh, certainly n- no religion whatsoever, really. It just wasn't part of our DNA. It's not what sure. we did as a family. And then I saw this family who was very uh, devout in their practices. Um, they belonged to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And mm-hmm. I got very curious. Yeah. And I was studying all these different religions. And so I started asking them questions. And that's led me on, you know, my own personal lifelong journey. So that, that was certainly, uh, they were certainly a huge influence on me and continue to be now. And after I, I had this religious conversion, uh, ended up starting dating uh, one of their daughters, and then we got married. And uh, I mean, there was a lot that happened in between there, but eventually we got married. And now we're 21 years into our marriage and couldn't be happier. That's fantastic. I understand that journey. Wow, fantastic. So, um, that's great to know. All right, let's talk about your education. So after high school, I mean, we all need to dig into high school. Everybody goes to high school pretty much. What was the next step uh, going off to university? Did you go right away? Did you take a gap year? What did, what did the journey for education look like? Well, I did not have a great vision for my life in terms of what I thought I could accomplish. In fact, I, I, I was, I would say, very much a product of my hometown in the sense that I never really saw beyond the borders of my hometown. So I went, uh, I went to this school in my hometown, this small college that was there because it just never occurred to me to do anything else. Okay. And I was there about two years and starting to feel very trapped. I kind of developed this George Bailey complex where I wanted to get out, but I didn't see how I could get out. It just never crossed my mind. I could really do much. I didn't think of myself as very capable or intelligent. And so I didn't have much of a vision for my life. Okay. Um, and then consistent with this story of my religious conversion, I decided to serve as a missionary for my church. Mm-hmm. And so uh, in that, in our, in our religious tradition, when you do one of these missions, you don't choose where you go, you get assigned. Sure. And, and it's a very kind of monastic experience. I mean, it's all in self-sacrifice. There's yep. no, there's no downtime. There's very little recreation time. Seven days a week. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you, where did you serve your mission? Yeah. So I got asked to serve in Korea. Oh, wow. Um, in the Seoul area and real close to the demilitarized zone in South Korea and the country around there. And that was really where I started to catch a vision for myself. I remember distinctly walking along one day with another missionary through uh, Sangedong in, in northern Seoul. And I turned to him and I said, you know, I could do anything I want with my life. 
And this was a guy who'd been raised to think that he could do that anyway. So he's like, well, yeah, of course. Sure. And, you know, for him, it was just obvious. For me, it was this great revelatory moment. And that's when I started to really think about, well, if I can do anything I want, what, what do I want to do? Right. You know? Well, I bet in Korea, as a six foot six white guy, you stuck out like a sore thumb over there. Yes, that's probably fair to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go knocking on a door and who's this giant on the door with the little name tag and the white shirt and, you know, the good, the clean haircut, right? So Yeah, uh, for sure. And Korea yeah. is a very homogenous country. So just being, just being an American alone makes you stand out, but you add yes. the height to it and you're... Oh, yeah. 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 Most of those people range in between like, five two and five six that's kind of the five eight tops you know there's not a lot of height over there in, in most cases so anyway i'll we'll tell you there. though it's it's interesting the younger generations are are quite a bit taller yeah and it has to do with uh, nourishment yep nutrition when you, yeah yep. when you went back to the you know my grandparents age uh and maybe even my parents age they were very malnourished and didn't have you know the food that they needed in part because japan had colonized the country and had them very oppressed and so they couldn't grow the food they needed to and so they without that nourishment they didn't grow but my generation and younger is quite a bit taller so it's interesting yeah it is and then also too i recently did sort of serendipitous that we're talking about this gosh about a month back i read some article because i'm just a i'm just a guy that's always looking for something to learn i i don't watch like regular tv i'll just watch documentaries and stuff anyway i saw out on youtube a um, documentary that was comparing the heights of South Koreans versus North Koreans, because, no, you know, North Korea is under supreme suppression and, you know, it's just not the same, you know, cultures. And so it was ridiculous. It was something like an average of four inches difference in the current generation of those in South Korea versus North Korea, because they're just the malnutrition in North Korea um, because of the oppression of the communist system. So th I thought I found that fascinating. It was three point something um, height difference. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So. Okay, so you're going to school. What were you studying? Did you have a particular major in mind? I mean, what what were you working on? So the other revelation I had, I, I used the word revelation, but the, the, other, the other realization I had when I was serving my mission was that uh, I, I had always had a talent for writing. Mm-hmm. But it never, had never seemed practical to me. When I was a little boy, I remember reading uh, reading f various fantasy novels, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, I'd love to be a writer. But then I thought, well, I can't. No one can ever be a writer. Right. So uh, it was in Korea that I realized, well, perhaps I can do this. And I met a I met a Korean woman who really had a talent for music, mm -hmm. and we went to her home, which was a, you know an apartment, and she had a grand piano in there, and she played. A, a song for us once on this grand piano and I was so inspired by her desire to continue to pursue what she was passionate about and mm -hmm. good at right that I this light bulb went off and I thought I can do the same and I'd always had a, a, an affinity for writing and a, and a, and a skill with it so uh, I, I changed my major to become an English major okay. and started focusing on writing and and creative writing in particular and have never really looked back Okay, so liberal arts degree, English. Did you have a career in mind? I mean, we look at our world today where, you know, it's different when you're older, you know, our, you're closer to our generation. But me and liberal arts degrees, how, nobody gets jobs with those. I've got a, a niece um, that uh, attended BYU and she, got, and she was an incredibly um, talented young lady, but she got a degree in folk dance. Now. Yeah. When she got out of school, she didn't have a teaching certificate. And so she couldn't even be a drama or a music teacher somewhere at a school. And so now she's having, you know, at age like 27, she's having a hard time finding employment. So did you have a job in mind or was it just heads down, I'm gonna, you know, be an English major? Well, I didn't have a job in mind at the outset, but I will tell you, I'm a very practical person. So even today, when I hear someone tell me they're gonna be an English major or some other little large degree, I cringe. Yeah. Uh, and I do think it's a problem that so many people take on massive debt to get degrees that simply are not marketable. I think that's a real problem that people don't think through. Yeah, I I have I always had a sense that somehow or another I was going to need to provide for my family. 
Um, my wife is a very strong person and a very intelligent person. She was valedictorian of our high school, could have done anything with her life. But when we met and started dating, she made it clear to me then that she wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. So for me, there was never any confusion about what I was going to do. One way or another, I was going to have to provide for my family. Sure. Initially, when I went into English, I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm very, very good at, I was very good at editing, I found. Uh, and so I thought, okay, I can go into publishing and I can be an editor. That would be a way to provide for my family. But as I progressed through my degree, uh, I, real, I realized that not just writing, but perhaps law would be another option okay. for me. Okay. So when I, when I went into graduate school, I pursued both an MFA in creative writing and law school. And the and intent was always to do those, to do both of those, which would give me a nice platform to actually have a practical way of taking care of my family. A side note, I just, I think about this all the time because there's all this big, uh, uh, quote, crisis about, you know, paying off people's student loans. And I, I think there should be a uh, scoring system. I think that if you have the side that you're going to pick a, you know, they should put a score on every degree. So medical might be a nine or a 10, something like that. But if you're getting a liberal or arts degree in folk dance or something, well, maybe that's a two and you can only borrow so much against those, um, those degrees. Because if you come out of school with $150,000 debt, you know, as a, as a folk dance person, well, you, you're gonna be paying off that student loan for the rest of your life, you know, kind of stuff, because you just can't make that much money. So that's my own little goofy um, idea. It's like, I think they should just put a score on it and limit what you can borrow because, uh, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea that, that the rest of the world it gets straddled with uh, uh, this debt. And it's a bad idea for kids to get in that much debt um, for something that doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I think students really need to take some more responsibility to look at what really are my options when I finish here. I mean, I was fortunate. I went, I had scholarships. So I came out of undergrad debt free when I did my MFA and MFA in creative writing is not a lucrative degree. No, it's a, uh, it's a terminal degree to, which, you know, which is means the equivalent to a PhD. So you can use it to get a tenure track professorship somewhere, mm -hmm. but it's not a lucrative degree. I was fortunate there again to get uh, a full ride scholarship. And so it came out mostly debt free from that as well. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't. I mean, I just read an article yesterday of someone that graduated from the with an MFA from the Columbia Film School. He had three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, oh. and at most was getting jobs around thirty thousand a year. Right. And I think students need to be much more responsible. Sure, you might become the next Steven Spielberg, but most likely you're never going to get a job that pays much more than that. And you need yeah. to be real smart about the degrees you're going. I, I am all for people chasing their dreams. I chase sure. mine. Yeah. And have largely been able to live them. But uh, I think along the way, you've got to add some practical sense to what you're doing. So after you return from your mission, uh, a lot of guys are ready to, to get married and settle down. How old were you when you got married? Were you still in school? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I don't know if your listeners are, are familiar with our, our, my religious background. I, I, so I went on this mission. My wife and I were dating at that point, mm -hmm. um, but she was going to date lots of other people when I was on my mission in Korea. And she did. I like to joke around that she dated half the guys at the college she was at and thankfully didn't fall in love with anybody while I was serving in <laughs> Korea. Uh, and, and when I got home, she was still available. And so we got married very quickly. So I was 22 and she was 20. And okay. we just knew we knew almost immediately when I got back that okay. we were meant for each other. Fantastic. And, uh, and was, was that and years. so right there, uh, you were still in school then or just starting school, returning to school, right? Yeah, we had both at that point, we had both finished two years of college. Okay, fantastic. Well, it's it's a very mature thing to do. You know, a lot of kids wait for a long time and bounce around and kind of, I don't know, in my opinion, sort of waste some time, but you know, everybody has their own path. Okay, so what'd you do right out of school? You got your law degree. Uh, did you go to work for a traditional general uh, practice? What was your first step in with your law degree? So I did my I did my MFA in creative writing, which was three years. Then went to law school at the University of Michigan. Okay. And uh, we immediately moved to Denver, Colorado, where I, I had a job lined up with a large law firm uh, in Denver. Okay. It's it was it's a firm that covered most of the nation, but I was in their Denver office. And then I clerked for a federal appellate judge in Denver. So oh, cool. uh, Judge Tim Temkovich, who's now the chief judge of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. I uh, clerked for him and then went to my firm and started to build out my career. Fantastic. Now, I know you work in a particular niche now. Um, 
will you tell us about that or what you're doing right now as far as the niche that you're working in in law? Sure. So I, I specialize in law and religion and, and First Amendment, but specifically with most of my emphasis in law and religion. Okay. And uh, the First Amendment has two clauses in it that we refer to as the religion clauses. And so I, I specialize in those and research on them and publish on them and, and work in that area. Okay. And uh, that's what I do as a law professor, uh, teach in that area and guide students to help learn and understand that better. I also run at the University of Texas, uh, Texas's Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center and its related law and religion clinic. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that it was that granular of type of uh, course. Uh, or I guess breakdown of that particular niche in law. So um, how long have you been down there at the University of Texas? Just one year. I did, we accepted this professorship a year ago. It, it's a, a bit of a circuitous story, but I was in private practice in Denver. I was an equity partner at my firm. And from the outside, I think I was living the dream. In fact, people would call me up and they would say, you know, how you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm living somebody's dream. And people would chuckle at that. And I, realized, <laughs> and I realized, oh, people think that's funny. So I started telling it to people all the time. And then one day I realized it was true, uh, that I was living someone's dream, but it wasn't mine. Right. I, I was spending my days in the pure practice of law. I had started teaching at the University of Denver's law school, okay. a law and religion course. And uh, I had started publishing. I was publishing a book and kind of moving forward with that dream of wanting to pursue, of pursuing writing. And I realized that I was on this intellectual high when I was teaching and writing. Sure. And that would kind of plummet when I would just go do the pure practice of law. Nothing wrong with practicing law, but for me, there was just such a high when I was teaching and writing. So I decided I needed to transition into academia. Okay. And that's hard to do in the legal and legal academia, but I had the resume to do it. And so I, I took a position at Stanford Law School. Okay. Uh, where I, was a, I became a research fellow in the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford. And then the University of Texas had this fully endowed position open up. And uh, thankfully, I was uh, selected to, to run the center here. So that's how I ended up here. Well, that's impressive. You know, you've been at three really prestigious schools. Uh, DU is an amazing school. And then, of course, Stanford and now the University of Texas. So it wasn't like you were at some uh, podunk small school with not a big uh, credentials. So that's impressive. How long were you at Stanford? Uh, that's funny too. So I was supposed to be at Stanford for three years and the idea was to be there doing this research fellowship for three years and then transition into a professorship somewhere. That would have been the normal timeline. Sure. Uh, I was at Stanford, uh, I want to say about eight months when Texas started recruiting me for this professorship. So we ended up being at Stanford only a year and then, and then came to the University of Texas. Fantastic. Uh, Austin's one of my favorite uh, places, as I told you off air in our prep and stuff. So now you've written a couple books. Tell us about the books. Sure. So my first book came out in 2019. It's mm -hmm. called Deep Conviction. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it brings to life four key cases in U.S. history involving the free exercise of religion. Okay. And uh, one of my frustrations being in this field is most people have absolutely no idea what we mean when we say the words religious freedom. Yeah. Especially with the way the media covers it. Uh, oh. They only cover these big culture war cases that yeah. involve yeah. either LGBT plus rights or abortion. And the reality is uh, those make up just the tiniest sliver of yeah. cases yeah. involving the free exercise of religion. So I pitched this idea to my publisher of, hey, why don't I do a kind of a religious freedom for dummies book? Okay. Uh, they didn't like that. They rejected it, but they came back. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Who's going to read that? <laughs> yeah. They came back and they said, but hey, uh, you know, you, you have a creative writing background. What if you were to bring to life some cases and really tell the stories from the perspective of the people involved so we can really kind of live it as they lived it and know it was wow. at stake? Uh, and through that, then learn some of these conflicts and, and what religious freedom really means. I thought, oh, I love that idea. So I, started writing that book, got the contract, and we published that in 2019. Okay. And then my latest book is called The Immortals, which has nothing to do with the law, uh, but it tells the story of the USS Dorchester in 1943. It was sunk by a German U-boat off the mm -hmm. coast of Greenland. Oh, wow. And four chaplains and a black Coast Guardsman ended up being responsible for saving the lives of 200 sailors from that wow. attack. 
and they all sacrificed themselves to save hundreds of others. And so I tell their stories and about that night and everything they did to save everyone. Oh, fascinating. I'm going to have to read that one. I, I love uh, human stories like that. Uh, you know, the sinking of, um, oh my goodness, was it the, um, oh, the uh, US, USS Indiana. And, yep. you know, the story of, you know, 600 went into the water and I forget how many came out, but the survival stories are incredible. Yeah. So I think one of the craziest things I've ever done, just from a, a perspective, been on a cruise and we're pretty far out into uh, the ocean and went up and watched the sunrise. And it's a weird dynamic being on the ocean and having and completely pitch dark and having no idea where the sun was going to rise. So, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, cause you're out there in the middle of this water and there's no geograph, there's no mountains like here in Colorado on the front range, we have mountains to navigate by or, you know, certain things. But when you're out on the ocean on a ship and you've been, you get there in the middle of the night, there's just no perspective. So it's kind of a game to watch where the sun's going to come up. All right. Fantastic. So let's dive into this a little bit more. Um, well, of course, I'm assuming your books are available on Amazon then. They're available. Yeah. Anywhere books are sold. Okay. Uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, just you name it, should be available. I, especially the Immortals has been picked up by most libraries across the country and really across the world. Fantastic. So people should be able to get their hands on it. Available on Audible, both both books. Okay, you just you just sold me. I know what I'm going to be listening to for the next couple of days. There I'm a po- I'm a podcast junkie, but I'll jumping all over that. So fantastic. Um, so tell me a little bit more about you know we have this crazy culture right now uh in the western culture because it's not just the united states it's across europe um the united states it also fits into australia i have i have a lot of interviewed a lot of people down there and we just have this whole situation with woke and you know the things that are going on where people are trying to to cancel those who don't have the same opinion and as you mentioned the lbgtq whatever letters all of that is and i'm totally respectful of all those things but that seems to be the focus on, you know, this fight with, with morals and religion and those types of things. And um, so in particular, you talked about a, fur, a wider breadth of cases. Um, what are some of those type cases that you see that aren't the ones that are on, you know, the CNN and MNS, BBC and Fox and stuff? Well, to give you a sense of it, the, of the reported cases out there, involving religious freedom Mm -hmm. the ones that intersect with lgbt plus rights are less than one percent okay wow that's of that's of the reported cases of the unreported matters that are just percolating out there where lawyers are helping either churches or individuals with various religious freedom issues Uh uh-huh the number probably drops down to almost zero uh the, the you know the cases that intersect with lgbt plus rights okay but the media uh, they want clicks. Oh, yeah. And, and yep. this is both media on the right and the left. I'm not Absolutely. singling out anyone. They want clicks. And the, and the cases that get clicks are the ones that involve big culture war issues. So they, the only cases they report on, really, are the ones that involve the LGBT plus rights. Sure. At my clinic here, so at the clinic at the University of Texas, you know, I get phone calls and, and things all the time. People are coming and asking if we'll take their cases. What, what a legal clinic does, it's a type of pedagogical structure in U.S. law schools that you have clinics where students get to work on cases in a pro bono capacity to help people in all sorts of different situations. Okay. And, and so in the law and religion clinic, we help people who need assistance anytime law and religion arises. And just to give you an example of some of the types of cases that we worked on this last semester, okay. um, I, I, of the dozens and dozens of phone calls I've received, not, not a one of them had anything to do with culture war issues. The types of cases we've worked on are representing a historically black church that for 20 years they had purchased a piece of land and for 20 years they saved their money to build this building on this land and right at the 11th hour when they finally had enough money the city where they are situated came in and tried to take the land through eminent domain from the church so representing the church is in that situation uh representing a sick prisoner who is being denied um the right to not shave his hair and to not cut his hair or shave his beard, uh, representing a Sikh who's trying to become a chaplain and is facing discrimination in the military. Okay. Um, working with, uh, you know, uh, another prisoner who's being denied the right to wear a religious garb 
that doesn't pose any safety issues. Uh, it goes uh, again and again and again, examples like that. Okay. Uh, we're helping, helping a, a faith-based charity who's trying to help the homeless, but is facing severe zoning restrictions and not being able to allow to help the homeless in the city in which they're situated. Those are the types of cases that religious freedom law plays a crucial role in our society. Yeah. And they just get ignored by the media because they don't, they don't cause the outrage and uproar that the cultural war cases do. Right. And there's no supporting any particular narrative one way or the other. So, right. uh, yeah, that doesn't doesn't fit their their story and their clicks and their outrage. Yeah, it, it, we've just have a it's insanity. I don't even want to get started on it. It's a, just an insane uh, media and social media culture right now. It's just uh, I get so spun up about censorship. It just drives me bananas. I don't care what somebody puts out there as long as long as they're not threatening violence. You know, hey, let people let people say what they want to say. That's you know, that's the basis of our country. So uh, how many cases a semester do you guys work on? It varies and it'll depend just on the, the student capacity and, you know, not all cases are the same. Some are sure. re relatively small and don't require a lot of work. Some can be heavily involved uh, with a lot of discovery and a lot of documents to review. So it, it'll really depend. This last term, I think we had nine matters going mm -hmm. um, live this next term, I suspect we'll probably have fewer because some of the matters we have will require more work mm -hmm. and uh, we, we won't want to take on too much. Yeah, I, I would imagine it, it varies. Like you just said, lots of variables in there. So how do these cases um, either get picked uh, or get to you? Do, do, do people come to the University of Texas looking for this? Do you go out looking for these cases? What's the engagement look like? Uh, mostly it's a matter of, of me spreading the word to my network and okay. then uh, getting either referrals or having churches just call me up. You know, for some okay. churches, you can imagine it's an answer to their prayers. They've got oh, yeah. the city bearing down. They are going to lose their land. They don't know what to do. I mean, one of the problems we have in the United States as well uh, with media coverage is most people tend to assume that, uh, assume that churches have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And while that is true for some religions. For some. Yeah. The vast, vast, vast majority of churches in the United States are small congregations, barely getting by. They don't have the money or the sophistication to fight complex legal battles. They don't. They wouldn't even know where to begin if a city comes along and says, "We're going to use our eminent domain power to take your land." Yeah. Um, and and so our <clears throat> our hope is to just continue to spread the word that we're here, and we'll take as many cases as we realistically can handle. Yeah. Well, one thing too, when you talk about churches having resources, you know, my knowledge of uh, churches, I had a, a similar um, personal shantagua of uh, exploring, you know, different religions. I did that for about uh, 18 months as a young man. And, you know, the, the practice of tithing isn't as prevalent as it used to be for lots of religions. And so there is a misnomer that churches are loaded and there are people thinking, well, we need to go tax the churches and stuff like that. Well, when tithing is not a um, practice of a, of a church, if it's a small one or, or whatever, it makes it really difficult for them to have the resources to do things like, like this. Well, that way, that's why that was such a concern during the pandemic when churches weren't allowed to meet. Yeah. For some churches, um, I'll take my own religious tradition as an example. It's very, very easy for people to pay tithing. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's, it's become systematized in a way that people could even pay remotely. And so it works out just fine. And, and, yeah. and, and at least in my church, things were able to thrive. But most churches, they meet on Sunday and they pass a plate around and people give what they can. Yep. And that's usually just enough to keep the lights on, yep. keep whatever building that they were able to build or, or rent, and then maybe pay a very modest uh, salary to a minister. And these usually are very modest salaries, somewhere yeah. in the 30,000 range. Oh, yeah. um, when the pandemic hit and churches could no longer meet, that was literally life and death for some of these congregations. And wow. some, many have not survived. Um, and trying to figure that out has been difficult. So yeah, I mean, the reality is the reality of religion on the ground is not really what gets portrayed in the broader society. They tend to only think of large institutional churches with a broad hierarchical structure, not all these small congregations across the United States. Yeah, I can remember I grew up Catholic and my grandparents lived in a tiny little town, Valentine, Nebraska. My family had homesteaded out there. And I can remember going to, to mass and 
uh, they pretty much counted on my grandfather uh, because he was a wealthy or rancher and, and made good money. And there were a handful of um, parishioners there that, you know, when they did pass, it was in, an, you know, the envelopes went around. They counted on him because he was so generous and, you know, he was just staunch about tithing. And um, we would go to some bazaars and church events and things like that, you know, with my family. And, you know, the priest was just gushing all the time about my grandfather because he knew they really depended on him to help keep things afloat. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic for a lot of churches. I can imagine with the pandemic, it's just been hard because there's no passing the plate when you're sitting at home. Right. Yeah. And it becomes very difficult. And the other thing I want to emphasize, too, is religious freedom doesn't just protect, you know, devout religious attenders. Right. Um, one of the stories I tell in my first book, Deep Conviction, is about an atheist uh-huh. and how religious freedom law protected him uh, and, and played a crucial role in helping him get a job that the state was otherwise denying him because he couldn't uh, express belief in a supreme being. So, you know, religious freedom protects atheists and agnostics as much as it protects Christians, Muslims, Sikhs, just keep going down the list. Yeah. Wow, what a fascinating uh, niche in law. I, I have found, fa- but so needed because we just, there's so many situations now where, I don't know, you know, we grew, the country was formed by, you know, expatriates of trying leaving their countries to go have religious freedom you can't say the united states was 100 percent christian you know there were quakers and you know all kinds of different sects that came to the united states and religion played such a big role in so many people's lives and families for generations and generations and you know i'm not gonna i'm not negative nancy but you know that's fallen off for a lot of people and um i i feel i don't know i'm empathetic and feel sorry for people who haven't had a deep understanding or experience or involved in faith things because um, it just adds so much to your life, so much more balance. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, here's a couple of interesting anecdotes for you. One is one of the big phrases that we use, uh, we scholars in the law and religion field use is called the Puritan mistake. Okay. And, and it was coined by a very influential law professor named Douglas Laycock, who, um, we, when we talk about the Puritans, we often say, well, the Puritans came to these shores for religious freedom. And it's true, they did, but they came only for religious freedom for themselves. Right. They weren't really interested in protecting anybody else. In fact, as far <laughs> as they were concerned, if, if you weren't a Puritan, you could get out of Massachusetts. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, and, and it's a very common human mistake to commit the Puritan mistake, right? It's, I, I asked Doug one time, I said, why did, you, why did you blame the poor Puritans? I mean, it seems to me that every... <laughs> Every human group in existence tends to commit this mistake. He said, well, yeah, but I was trying to find a group that my, I thought my audience would recognize, you know. That <laughs> okay, fine. And, and, and the Puritan mistake probably does sound more sophisticated than just calling it the human mistake. Um, that's one interesting historical anecdote. Uh, so the Puritans, like the rest of us, had to learn how to protect religious freedom for everybody, not just for themselves. Right. The second interesting anecdote is at the time of the founding of the United States, there actually was a similar trend occurring to what we see today with people leaving religion. Okay. And if you, if you go back and you listen to the debates uh, when they were trying to put together the first 10 amendments, Uh they were debating the second amendment and they were talking about whether or not there should be protections for religious freedom for Quakers and groups like that who were pacifists in the second amendment. Uh And uh, one of the, one of the folks in the the continental Congress made the argument. They said, look, Religion is going away. In a few years, religion won't even matter anymore. You know, this is the age of reason. It's, it's in, we're enlightened. We don't need religion anymore. And so you had this vast group of people leaving religion in, in huge numbers, like what we see today. This is the right. 1780s and 90s. Um, and so he made the argument, why should we put in religious freedom protections when there aren't going to be any religious people around? It, all we're going to end up with is <laughs> all we're going to end up with is people taking advantage of this who don't who aren't really sincere in their religious beliefs. And then, of right, course, right. 10 years later, we had the Great Awakening, which was this vast revival and return to religion. And 20 years after that, we had the second Great Awakening yep. and then an explosion of other religious groups. So we've seen. We've seen patterns like this before, but I think at the end of the day, most people at some point in their lives ask themselves, why am I here? Where am yeah. I going? What is the purpose of life? What happens when I die? And, yeah. and they What's turn the big somewhere meaning? for that. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, you, you, you point out a really good um, a fact. It's been proven throughout the history of man, you know, clear back to even somewhat undocumented times where there's pride cycles. And, uh, you know, people go through these pride cycles where, hey, I, I got it all. We got this figured out. I don't need any of this religion stuff. And then there's these falls and stuff like that. And so we've seen that in the United States several times, you know, in the 1830s and different periods of times where there are some some revivals. I'm, I'm praying for one now, <laughs> uh, just because of kind of where things are. I, I just, you know, when I was a young man, I bounced around um, looking at all different types of uh, religion. There was a point in time, just like you explained, I said, you know, there's got to be more. And uh, I was out mountain biking in the uh, Utah, you uh, went when I kind of went through some things on that. And, you know, it's, I just think it, it grounds people. It adds um, a layer of, um, humility it adds a layer of um discipline there's just a lot of good things and, and i don't care what anybody's faith are you know pick one that you like and and uh run with it but it's i think it's so found foundational and it helps with family environment too so yeah for sure for sure and the key the key in our society is to recognize that you know everyone should have the right to pursue and find that truth for themselves Mm -hmm. And we should all have the ability to proselytize and teach and try to convert one another without using the heavy hand of government sure. to, to, ha to play it, you know, on the playing field. We should be on an equal playing field. And that's, that's really what religious freedom does. So one of the reasons I wrote The Immortals was because what made that book, that story so compelling when it happened in 1943 was each of these four chaplains who sacrificed themselves to save these other men were all from a different each was from a different faith okay. and they saved a whole bunch of men who were from different faiths from them and the last thing the survivors saw as their ship was going into the water was these four chaplains each of a different religion holding hands and praying each in their own way uh you had a catholic priest praying in latin you had a protestant praying in english you had uh, a rabbi uh, uttering something in Hebrew and the ship goes down with them yeah. holding hands together. And it became this powerful moment of interfaith and action where none of them gave up their core beliefs or identities. Right. But were willing to sacrifice themselves to save others. Right. Uh, yeah. And then several hours later, you have a black man who had absolutely no duty whatsoever to save anybody because at the time military regulations didn't allow him to be anything other than a cook. Okay. But he dove into the water again and again and again to help save over 100 men. Wow. And so it's this idea of selflessness and recognizing that we can, um, we can sometimes sacrifice for people who are different than us. And we absolutely should if we expect our country to continue to survive. Wow, um, that is almost a, a replica of Hacksaw Ridge. Have you watched, have you watched that film? I haven't read that story yet. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's a great story. It's a... Uh, um, I forget which religion the, the um, soldier was, but he was, he was a seventh day, seventh day Adventist. I seven. Think. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and just, you know, wouldn't carry a gun, but yet, you know, in a, in that one big battle there on, uh, was it Iwo Jima or it was one of the big battles and saved, you know, over a hundred people uh, running around getting shot at. And, you know, I guess the Lord was protecting him because uh, it's quite the story. It was a great human endeavor and a lot of respect for that. So what's next for you, Stephen? Um, what's next on the horizon? Well, I'll continue to expand the First Amendment Center here at the University of Texas. I'm just so thankful for our, uh, our donors who made it possible and endowed the center. It's, it's great to be able to highlight and spotlight the scholarship of all of the wonderful people, not just in Texas, but across the country working on First Amendment issues. There are complex problems that need to be resolved. And if people want to watch some of the I guess, interesting scholarly debates related to First Amendment topics. They can they can search out our website and find we host events all throughout the year of scholars from the top law schools across the country coming and debating ideas and papers and discussing these things. That's that's a big goal. Uh, I'm also neck deep right now in my next manuscript. I was going to ask that. Yeah, it's the uh, there. It's a true story of a man who was shot down behind enemy lines during the Korean War. And when he landed, he broke both of his ankles and then Ooh. was captured by the Chinese army. Uh, most people don't know this, but the Chinese army played almost as big a role in the Korean War as the Korean, North yep. Korean army did. Yep. And uh, he managed to escape. 
And the way he managed to escape was there was a North Korean soldier who was quite religious. But when the communists had taken over North Korea, they started to either imprison or execute anyone who was actively involved in religion because they saw it as a threat to their regime. Right. He had been drafted into the army and then had to keep this secret. And so he was in this kind of religious closet for months on end while he was in the military. Uh, and then out of nowhere, he meets this. He, he actually recaptures this American who's trying to escape and the two of them together escape to the south. So I've the, the widow of both men, the widows of both men are still alive, one in Korea, one here in the United States. I've been able to interview them, interview family members, wow. uh, get all their you know get diaries and letters and other things. And I'm, I'm retelling that story. Wow, that's fantastic. When do you think you'll have that finished? Uh, my manuscript deadline is August 2nd, so right around the corner, but it'll get published around Father's Day next, next spring. Next, next spring. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we'll give out your website for uh, the program down there. Um, well, uh, go here. This will be the easiest, the easier one. Go to stephentcollis.com. Okay. Uh, and then you can find a link to the First Amendment Center. Um, if, and the reason okay. I'm... The reason I'm waffling on the First Amendment Center's website is it's it's a long EDU website yeah. and, splash and everything else. I'll the know. other easier option is just Google uh, Texas Law First Amendment Center, and it'll pop right up as the first thing. It's called the Beck Lachlan First Amendment Center. Fantastic. Well, you've been a great guest today. Thank you for coming on and sharing your story and, and what you're working on. I, I, I just have a lot of admiration for what you're doing because there's such a need for it, and I don't think it'll ever end. One last question, though. Are, do you pay attention to some of the international issues just as someone who is a scholar in this space, you know, like what's happening with the Uyghurs in China or, you know, there's genocides that are happening all over the world and they are normally based on religious type things. Uh, so do you keep an eye on all that as, as someone who studies this field? I do very much so uh, for a couple of reasons. One of which is one thing I often tell people is that the the, the peace that we enjoy in the United States, we're the most religiously diverse country in the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. And the peace that we enjoy is unique. It's unique historically, yep. but it's also unique in the world today. And, and the reason we have it is because of the religious freedom we enjoy. And it's both protecting the free exercise of religion, but also not having a state church, yeah. uh, you know, a church uh, state uh, sanctioned religion, uh, including not having state sanctioned atheism. Yeah. Uh, religious freedom is incredibly important for that. So we do follow that. I was just at Notre Dame last week. Mm -hmm. uh, Notre, Notre Dame has a wonderful new uh, initiative going on that they call the Religious Freedom Initiative. And they, uh, as part of these meetings last week, they honored a man who had escaped China's prosecution of the Uyghurs. Oh, wow. And he has now, he's come to the United States and has dedicated his life to exposing the atrocities that are happening there. And there really are uh, they really are extreme atrocities, concentration oh, camps, yeah. people being murdered. Uh, they, China's calling them re-education camps. But yeah. essentially what China is doing is taking people who want to worship Allah instead of worshiping the regime. And they're either killing them or imprisoning them. Yeah. And it is a great atrocity that's happening. And, and you're right. So, yeah, I do pay attention to those. It's not my primary focus, but right. you, can't, you can't be in this space without recognizing and, what's happening all over the globe. Yeah, it's crazy to me when you see a lot of young kids who think that socialism and communism is a great thing, and they don't stop to realize over the last 100 years, there, there have been about 120 million people murdered um, over genocide over these issues, whether a state was uh, eliminating you know, a religion or trying to impose one or atheism. So yeah, it, it's mind boggling to me. And then of course, our Western media just ignores most of that stuff. You know, that's, that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room and they're not going to step into that discussion because it's complex. But, you know, I, you know, when people worried about whether a, a football player is taking a knee in comparison to what's happening in China right now, I just can't even see how anybody can even equate those things. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's, it's really, um, it's really unbelievable what, what is happening in China. And, and I'll tell you, their influence is significant. Uh, a dean of a very prominent law school was giving a, a speech at a university recently. And uh, I don't know if I have permission to say who he is, so I won't say it out yeah, loud. Yeah, that's but, fine. But he gave, in his graduation speech, he said, 
two sentences about some of the atrocities that the Chinese regime uh, is committing against the Uyghurs. And within hours, he was receiving death threats and oh, yeah. threats from Chinese operatives. I mean, wow. it was really remarkable. Um, crazy. So it, it's happening, you know. Isn't it sort of mind boggling that here in 2021, that type of behavior is still going on in the world? Because the, yeah. we, the situation of the Uyghurs, we're not talking a small amount of people. It's the millions of people that they have incarcerated right now. I mean, it's, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. And it's disappointing that, I guess, developing the willpower to do something about it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it makes me it simultaneously makes me thankful. I, we should be grateful in the United States for what we have. You mentioned uh, speech earlier. You know, one of the things that the dean of our law school here said when talking about the First Amendment Center is that if there's anything our law school should be doing, a prominent law school at the University of Texas, it's promoting the idea of freedom of speech and that our philosophy is if you don't like someone's speech, the antidote to that is more speech. Yeah. Right. And get your ideas out there. Talk through the ideas. It's not to silence people, uh, which is sure. which is clearly not the tack taken in many countries across the globe today. So. Well, and in even what we see now, people with such ad hominem attacking others would have nothing to do with the actual topic. They're just going after the people who disagree with them. And that's 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 intellectually and emotionally um, immature or, or void. I mean, I just I don't even understand the concept where people want to have a conversation. You know what it is, is it's a it's a clever debate tactic. And if yeah. you're on the receiving end of that, what you need to do is call it out for what it is and say, yes. like, you're not discussing the merits of my argument. You're attacking me. Yeah. Um, and you need to call that out. Too often people end up getting very defensive and they say, well, no, no, I'm not what you're claiming. I am. You say, no, right. no, no, no. Look, I put some ideas on the table. Yep. You attack the merits of those ideas. You don't attack me. And if you can't attack the merits of those ideas, then you're kind of conceding that I have the right approach here. I mean, that's the way to do it. And you need to shift the conversation back to the merits because for a lot of the issues we deal with, the merits deserve robust discussion. And instead yes. we get lost in the weeds of ad hominem attacks, which is yeah. not helpful. Yeah. No, I, I do it on social media all the time. I have a bad habit of, um, I kind of disagree with just about everything the current governor of Colorado does uh, just because he's way out there and it's, it's beyond common sense most of the time. And I'm a common sense person. You know, I just look at there. So I'll go out there and make a comment about something and it's factual. I will, you know, I try to stay out of the weeds and stuff like that. And the people just come attacking and I will call them out. And you know, it, it, it shuts them down every time the, the, I have not yet seen somebody who has attacked me that I've said exactly what you said. You know, let's let's discuss the merits of this. And if you don't have anything to do and bring facts, well, then, you know, is this the best contribution you have to the conversation? And the replies, zero. I mean, right. Because because it backs them down and making them feel kind of silly. So anyway, well, I got one last question for you. And you've been so uh, such a good uh, guest and so transparent and uh, sharing your journey and what you're up to. Um, you know, here in the Western cultures, we have this thing called a bucket list. Okay. So, and I've actually interviewed the bucket list guy. If that's his website. Uh, his name is Trav Bell. He's down in um, Melbourne, Australia. Great guy. Just talks about living purposeful lives and stuff. But anyway, that list of things that we want to do before our time is over here on earth. Right. So, you know, things now that list can be anything that you can think of. I want to do this or that, but in the universe, as you know, there's always an opposite to everything. Okay. So a list of things you don't want anything to do with or don't want to experience again. Now that list rhymes with bucket and starts with an F, but this is a family show. So I'm not going to say that it's an, that F it bucket. So what might be an item or two on Stephen's F it bucket? And I'll give you some examples from mine. I'm not going to ever have a collection of pet snakes. That ain't going to happen. Uh, the snakes and myself, we're just not, not there. I'm never going to uh, eat any more sardines or caviar. This not interested. And this one I actually did an episode on. Um, I will never ever again do a Lakota Sioux sweat lodge, which I did <laughs> right here in Westminster, just down the road. And uh, the idea of excessive heat, excessive humidity, excessive drumming and chanting with a slice of nudity. I'm never going to do that again. So what might be an item or two that's on Stephen's opposite bucket list? Let's see. I have absolutely zero desire to live any place where there's an excessive amount of spiders. Okay. <laughs> that, that would be on that list. That would be uh, on that list. Yeah. What else? 
That's probably the big one. I can't think of too many things that I just absolutely would not do it. I'm trying to think of really negative experiences I've had that I never want to go through again. There was some type of soup I ate once. Most Korean food is fantastic. If your listeners have not had Korean food, I highly encourage them to go out yes. and find a good restaurant. There's a number of them in Colorado, by yes, the way. Yes, there are. Yes. A lot of really good Korean restaurants. But I ate some type of seafood soup in Korea where I bit into something and it exploded in my mouth. And there was kind of this gush of a mix of seawater and guts that flooded uh, over. I'll never eat that soup again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thanks for coming on. It's been great to, to meet you. I'm probably going to have you back once your next book's out. I know that's a ways away, but uh, we're going to be here. We're doing some fun things. And so um, thanks for coming on, Stephen. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate All it. Right. Well, that'll be a wrap for today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to stop by uh, Stephen's website. Uh, so Stephen Collis, so it's C-O-L-L-I-S dot com. And then do stop by the show website, uh, rexandrewshow.com, because all of the uh, profiles for all of our previous guests, uh, Stephen, and then upcoming guests, we have about 60 in the queue. So there's always something interesting going on here at the Rex Andrews Show. So until next time, I'll say the things I say at, at the end of every episode, be safe but be bold and make it a great day.